Everybody? Yes, everybody. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I would first like to say thank you to the organizers. It's been a really great conference up till now, so um, I'm really enjoying it. And it's probably going to go on till late tonight, I guess, for a lot of people. So, um, yes, uh, Rubinius, I'm secretly suspecting that the organizers have a plan because it's actually the third time somebody's going to talk about this today. So, hopefully, it will convince everybody to use it, experiment with it, play with it. Um, hopefully, people have ideas also from Brian's talk about like how can we make development better in the future. So this is me. Um, this is my handle basically everywhere. I usually claim it even if I don't use it very often in the service. Um, this is where I work. Uh, it's in the Netherlands. It's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I drive by cows in the morning uh, going to work. It's a really nice place. Um, and the question is what I'm actually going to talk about today. So there's a few, um, a few things. I'm going to basically go through a bunch of like small code examples, little things that we've encountered in other people's code, but also in our own code, that are either tricky, weird, or uh, in some way interesting. So hopefully at the end, uh, everybody, like people will have an idea like, okay, um, this is some pitfalls, okay, maybe I shouldn't do this in my code, um, but still really, uh, please try and run it and just use us because we want we, we don't mind having more of these weird stories. So, first of all, like little things like, if you ever do this, uh, we won't fix this. This is basically, uh, if you're overriding stuff like this, if you break the way people create classes in, in Ruby, we say sorry, sorry, but we're not gonna fix your code. So, luckily the, the case where we found this, the person writing it was like, oh yeah, that's indeed very, uh, very, very weird, and I'll fix it ASAP. So after that, he had a nice green bill on Rubinius on Travis, so it made us happy too. So there's a few things. I'm gonna start with more simple things. Things you never think of that anybody will ever encounter, and they still do. So this, for example, was an issue that somebody opened where um, he was actually overriding uh, the 2S method on a module he was defining at runtime. So probably doing some metaprogramming. And he was actually calling inspect, and inspect actually didn't show the name he put into S, because MRI does that. And basically, the thing is that people often uh, expect that the behavior in MRI actually is also the behavior that is kind of the standard. But uh, even if it doesn't work so in every implementation, so usually other implementations, implementations have to conform to changes like this. So, so this is like we end up doing this instead of alias method. So yes, this is maybe to some people like, oh, that's uglier. Yes, that's the awful truth of implementing Ruby. It's, you cannot always do what you want and what you th think is the best solution. You have to sometimes uh, be more pragmatic and think about stuff. So it's actually funny because Zed actually mentioned this principle this morning. So I'm not going to totally like go through all the nitty gritty details and explain it, but the people violating this principle is actually the cause of uh, quite a few bugs that only manifest in Rubinius. Uh, and that's actually because people do stuff like, like this. This is basically a small piece, like a small extraction from a problem where somebody was uh, inheriting from an uh, array and having their own list-like class and implementing some stuff. So basically what they did were overriding push, so basically adding an element to an array. It was going through some proxy method they set up, uh, but the biggest problem here was actually if you do uh, unmarshalling uh, an array in Ruby, so if you serialize it to some uh, to disk or whatever, uh, and then try to re, uh, re-instantiate it, uh, it actually in Rubinius uses Ruby code, because in Rubinius we try to write stuff in Ruby. So what happens is that we use push to say like, okay, we need to write an array, and then we loop through each element and add it to the new array we create when unmarshalling it. So but the problem here is that, uh, oh, that was it. But the problem here is that actually this uh, ended up in uh, an infinite loop because, um, because of the pro how the proxy object was behaving is that it was actually calling uh, array push again. So it basically, when unmarshalling, it went into uh, uh, the loop, and it got like this stack error. It's like completely blowing up at you. So what do we have to do? We actually have to do 
for really ugly stuff, stuff like this. So we have to say, okay, we cannot use nice Ruby notations because people might be overriding this. So yeah, this is not very nice. Um, it always makes us a bit sad if we have to do that. Um, of course, we could say like, oh, we're not doing this, we're not fixing this. Um, people change your code, fix your code, but it's, it's a pretty much an impossible situation there for us because we can tell all kinds of people to go fix their code, but that's not a viable solution because we want to be a, a viable alternative to people, so we should be able to run people's code straight out of the box but with as least effort for them as possible. So there's, there's worse offenders, even, even very nasty ones. I don't know if everybody sees what's going on here, but we're doing the same array thing. Ruby is apparently, library authors love that, doing that kind of stuff, I don't know why. Um, but here, this is like, we're aliasing a method. Like why, what are we doing here? And some super class slides and we're gonna use it there. And oh yeah, in the meantime, just change the meaning of what this method does. So basically we're, this is the, of course the method you're using when you wanna set an element in an array. But this code doesn't set an element in an array. It just adds it under some conditions written up here. So if I would say I have a property set instance here, and I would say like, okay, I wanna set the first element to a value, then it doesn't set the first element. I completely change the behavior. So please don't do this. So if you have code like this, please, for the sake of, of Ruby kind, change it and, and, and solve this problem and, and write better code. So basically this was refactored and ended up in something like this. This is not actually completely up to date, but basically it says like, why, we don't even need to be an array. Like Ruby is duct typing, we can just implement methods and you can use it as an array just, just for the behavior you need. And actually ended up here like using a hash because it was using some property name, property mapping. So this is actually the only one I'm actually gonna shame name, like who did that because it was me. Um, I was the idiot here. So that's the only one I'm gonna blame anybody for. So going to like another like frustration for us is, is GCC. I don't know. Like, how much people here have a reasonable experience with C and C++? Like, ah, oh, quite, quite a few people. Who likes GCC's error messages? Uh, from the people who do it, uh, did anybody, anybody ever try Clang? Um, so Clang's error messaging is, is so much, it's like light years ahead of, of what GCC's does. At least it feels to me that way. It kind of feels the same way that people come up to me, it's like, oh, I love Rubinius, I love the backtraces. It's like, yeah, that's just a tiny feature, but during development it can be pretty, pretty important and very, very important to you. So, but we have to do all the other stupid stuff with GCC, like, oh yeah, control may reach end of non-void function. It's like, okay, oh, this might point in a problem. Like, okay, maybe we have, uh, we're not returning some proper value here. But then you look at the chain chat we were doing, and it's like, this is the end of a case statement. And in a case statement you get like the default where it always ends up and it returns something. But apparently GCC thought like, ah, no, there's a way to go through this case statement that doesn't return anything. So you end up with like, we do stuff like this. So basically we, sh we shout at GCC, we, we call upon compiler gods and say like, please save us and, and help us. So. So, but this is enough ranting on, on GCC for now. Um, because, well, we need it, it's still there. Uh, we try to do as much with, with Clang as, as, as possible, so. Um, yeah, well, whatever. So I wanna talk about another subject, like what is, what is, what is a, a thing that you can encounter when implementing Ruby? Well, of course you're implementing Ruby, so then you, it means that you get come to realize that Ruby is like sometimes very, very weird. So I wanna show an example. Um, it's actually, this is running on Ruby 1.8. I think they fixed, they changed this like to be more sane in Ruby 1.9. So that's an improvement. So, so basically I have the following. Um, what you see here is, uh, for first, like, like ignore the, the class here. Like, okay, we have a method that yields an argument and we use it here and we splat the value. 
So what happens if the, the value you're passing in, if, if I would pass in like uh, the number one here, the argument here would be an array with one element with a value of one. It basically just wraps it up, uh, wraps it up neatly in an array. If I would actually pass in an array here, uh, it would come out here as an array because it would uh, deconstruct, like destructure it and restructure it into an array. So it would be the same array. So now the question is, here in this class, I have this method to array, which basically is used for coercion protocols like, oh, this object can behave, this object is like equivalent to an array, so if something wants an array, just call this method on it and we return something that works as an array. So now the question is like, what is the output if I run this? So does it do, oh, we're here. So we end up in this method, it gets one, and it like here, it, it, you see it properly in an array. Is it B, like it comes here, it sees an array, but it sneakily wraps it up in another array. Is it C, it comes here, and then it does, does wrap the original value up? Or is it D, it doesn't do this at all, it just wraps the value up. So please show of hands, who, think it's, who thinks it's A? One, a few more there. Okay, who thinks it's B? Who thinks it's C? Just a few hands. Who thinks it's D? Not everybody put up his hand. <laughs> I think I saw most of you for D, but I'm not sure. No, the, the, the correct answer actually is C. So it actually calls the method, but then it just completely ignores the return value. It's like, no, we don't need it. We'll just ignore it. So that's, that's one of the things that you end up implementing because you try to work like people like, okay, how does block, block argument handling work with splatting values and coercion protocols? And you end up in these cases and it's like, really? But then you end up implementing it anyway. So another thing, um, singleton methods. So singleton methods, like you define a method on a specific instance. So basically in Ruby, uh, you could think like, oh, I want to define a method on the float value 2.0, which actually isn't allowed. So you can say like, oh yeah, and it says like, can define singleton method. But looks like a pretty sane error message. It's like, yeah, you can agree with like, okay, actually this is true for all numer numeric values, so also for like fixed nums, big nums, and all that kind of stuff. Although fixed nums are even slightly different again, but that's a whole different story. The thing is that, okay, Ruby says you cannot do that. The funny thing is you actually can, if you want. Because you can do the following. Um, oh, no singular methods. What you can do is this. You can say, okay, I define the method singleton method added, which is called after you add a singleton method on a, on a class. You just don't do anything there. Then you set it up, and you can define it, and you can call it, and you say like, oh, it works. No exception. Because actually how this is implemented in Ruby, so if you go back to this, the default method, the default singleton method added method, what it does, it actually um, removes this method from the table, which was just added, and then raises an exception. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what you can work around if you want in Ruby. <laughs> So yeah, that's like, on the other end, it's, it's the power of Ruby that we can do stuff like that. I don't advise doing this, but it's still, still, still strange. So yay, we have a singleton method on numeric. So, oh, the next one is, the next one is quite funny. Um, I think it was in, a few weeks ago in Berlin, I was uh, talking to the Constantine, and um, we were actually, uh, at some point, uh, flip-flops came up. This is how you write a flip-flop in Ruby. And actually the people we were sitting with were, were thinking that we were trolling them. Like we were describing a feature in Ruby and they were like, are oh, you just kidding? That doesn't exist. That, doesn't, that is not there. That's just a joke. Like in the beginning they like went along because they thought we were trolling them. They were like making up weirder cases and weirder cases and we would go along too because they were actually kind of the case. So who, ha who here knows what flip flops do? Well, the thing is, uh, I don't know who said circuits. Yeah, actually the funny thing is, it's kind of like how it behaves in circuits. 
Um, because what actually it does is, if this condition is true, the first one, the whole, the, the whole statement here stays true until the second one becomes true. So basically, if you run this, you end up with this. So the first time three is true, it runs it. So then it's four, five, and six. And because after six, this evaluates is true, so the whole condition becomes false. So you think here, like it's double dot, like you can actually put a triple dot in here. And the first thing I thought when I first read about flip flops was that what it would do is like you would not get the six here because it would exclude the final one. But it doesn't work that way. So it works even differently because it works in a way that when this value is true, the second one in this condition is not evaluated. If you use three dots, the second one is evaluated. So yeah. And actually, um, actually, Constantine implemented this for Rubinius. I believe it's probably the most, uh, the, the best quality software part in Rubinius because nobody ever filed a bug report about this. <laughs> so it must be, it must be like working perfectly. So yeah, this becomes true. So I want to go to the next subject, which is something that a lot of people know, and that's called it's Ruby's C API. So you can write C extensions in Ruby. And, and wrap up libraries, C libraries, whatever. So the first problem with Ruby C API is that there is no C API. It doesn't exist. There's just internals that people use. So there's, there's like functions in there that are like, that add, implement like half of functionality. So you can create, uh, for example, this function creates like, this creates an object, like a data object, which is often used for wrapping up uh, uh, C value, so like maybe a C structure from a database driver you want to wrap up in something. So what it does is actually, you have to pass in a class, so you have to wrap it into a certain Ruby class. Can usually be, you can use object or your own wrapper class or whatever, it doesn't matter. The funny thing is, you can actually pass in null here. So you can, you can say like, oh, I just want to create this data object without any class. And in MRI, it works. So we actually got a bug report from somebody who has like who had an extension that actually was doing that. And the, the problem is like even in, in um, yeah. So this is like very internal stuff. And even in, in MRI, it would actually break people's code because it would like sec fault later at some point because actually there was a point there was an object with no class. And if you like, for example, ex inspect it, you get like this error, like terminated object, because actually MRI thinks, oh, this looks, this doesn't look right. It's probably garbage collected and I have some reference to it somewhere. So um, the thing is like, there are mo more and more of these examples. So uh, it really is sometimes annoying that people just start using them. It's like, oh, this is available, I'll use it. Uh, one of the biggest offenders usually is people accessing um, memory storage used for strings or array directly because we have to work around that very hard and it creates really slow extensions. So if you feel you're writing C extensions, um, you have stuff that's slow, uh, like please ask me afterwards. Like there are some ways on Rubinius that you can make it a lot faster, um, especially for string handling uh, by doing nice things instead of weird things in your C extensions. So actually we just ended up doing this. So actually we have less bugs here than MRI because we said like if there's no class, we'll just make it object. You know, it's like at least have something. So the next few things are actually not really about, um, about bugs from people anymore because, well, you gotta have some positive side that actually we have like issues with certain things, of course. So one of the things is like GC. So garbage collection can be pretty hard. Uh, MRI has a, what's called a conservative garbage collector. So it actually um, does not exactly know where all objects are. And it can happen that it just scans the stack. And if, if it kind of looks like a pointer, they're like, oh, this is probably something that's still alive, and, and they mark it. And actually, it can cause serious issues in certain C extensions where um, GCC optimizes some stuff away. So it can mean that if an object is only in existence for a very short time, it actually can be, uh, can be collected if it shouldn't be. Uh, we actually have kind of like 
A similar problem in Ravinius, but there it's like we, because we have to mark everything explicitly. So imagine the follower situation. So there's the C stack. So basically inside um, each function or, or, or a C++ function or C, it doesn't matter, uh, we have a stack of objects. So it could be that we have some pointer to an object because we use it in a certain piece of code. And actually it points at a certain place in memory in the heap where the actual data is located. So sometimes uh, we garbage collect and what the garbage collector can do in Arrhenius is actually it can move objects in memory. So first it was here and now it's here. Which is actually a very useful technique for um, compacting memory. So making sure your system can actually like give mem like uh, if you go back to Zed's talk about it doesn't return memory to the system. Well, this actually allows you to properly return memory to your system. So if you have a, if you have a script or a process that needs a few hundred megabytes of memory to do some stuff, but afterwards it's done, the garbage collector comes in, cleans it up, and suddenly the, your process releases the memory back and uh, you don't get like nasty issues with ever leaking, uh, ever leaking processes that only grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But because of this, we have to be very careful because if we have an object on a C stack and we do something that triggers a garbage collection, we have to be very careful because that actually can move. So what we have to do in our code is do things like here. Basically, if you look at this line, I don't know how clear it is, but this here does a send. So send is basically, it calls back into Ruby. For the very attentive people, this is actually the code that is in the first part where it just calls to Ari, which is there, and just ignores the result because it's never used afterwards. It's even called ignored. So the thing is that we say like, okay, this object is on the stack because we call into Ruby land, anything can happen. So to Ari could like handle a web request or something, I don't know, call back to GitHub, request some data from an API, shove it into an array and return it. I don't know, think of anything. So what it means that if, we, if we're after this line, this object could have moved. So that's why we have to say like, okay, this is on the stack and we have to be careful about it. So this stuff like this causes bugs that cause your program to crash like every once in a while, but never reliably. So, so if you have issues like that, please, like, please give us like, access to that code so we can fix cases like this and make sure that it doesn't happen on your application and we can actually properly do that. So another thing with garbage collection is Rubinius has generational garbage collection, so we don't have like one giant piece of memory where our all objects live. We have different spaces because most objects, if you if you write code, they don't live very long. So you maybe you allocate an object in a method, and after the method returns, it's not needed anymore. So so most objects die young. So what it means is that we have separate spaces for young objects because that means we keep this small. And if it's small, you can garbage collect it much faster. It does have, a, uh, it's tricky sometimes because you might have an array here that's old, like it existed for like ages in your Ruby program. And at some point you, sh you create a new string and you shove it into this array. So this array now has a reference to this string. Wait, this is falling off. So what you have to do is you have to like keep track of these things. You have to say like, okay, here's a hash which has reference to some string. So every time uh, we set like an instance variable into, uh, into an, uh, an object that is old and the value we set is a new one, we have to store, uh, store the value. So luckily for that, we like wrap it all up in explicit setters that handle it all for us. But it means we shouldn't do here direct assignment. But we should go nicely through the setter and say like, okay, this is some string in US ASCII encoding. So those are things like we have to be careful about when gar doing garbage collection. Um, but they're not that hard. They're just, you have to pay attention. So I don't know, sometimes it's hard for programmers to do that for everybody, I think. So uh, the last thing I wanna talk about is uh, concurrency. Ravinius actually has no global interpreter lock. So it runs your threads in parallel, so it runs all your threads and all your code, and can actually use all the cores in your machine or your server or, or anyway, any, anywhere. But it actually has some very tricky aspects that uh, 
a lot of times people don't, don't realize, or if you see them for the first time, you're really like, what the hell is going on here? Because this should not happen if I look at my code. So, so one, of the things, one of the most important things is called out of order execution. I don't know, if, does everybody know about this stuff? Or there's a few people. So basically, imagine the following piece of code. So we have, this is somewhere in our like, initialization in our, in, our, in our system. We have these four variables and we set them. At a certain point in time, we, like, we spawn a few threads and we have here a thread is running. And we say like, oh, A is one and B is two. This is the other thread, another thread that says C is one and D is two. What actually what a CPU can do and what it will very often do uh, because of uh, performance improvements and stuff like that, is actually it can, uh, it can like, change the order of those things like, without you knowing it, which is perfectly valid because I can do B is two and then A is one. It's, it's the same thing. If you look at the, the, the state of the system before, the state of the system after, it's the same. So there's no, there's no dependency here between these two variables. So it's not like one, one value depends on the other one. So basically, you can just swap them around in here, too. It's like, it doesn't matter at all. So, but the processor, of course, guarantees you that it won't get into a, an invalid state. There is, however, a slight problem with that, because it only guarantees that for the core of the thread you're running on. So what it means that you can have, for example, the following example. So basically, uh, I have an address. I set a street, a number, and this is, a, this is some shared variable I have that other threads can see too. And I set the address. So what, what can this, like what is the external behavior? So if you look from another thread at this thread, like what can shared address be? Well, of course it can be nil. Like it's not initialized yet. So we're before this code. And of course it can be like an address with some street and a number. Of course, this, there's like more room here, so you know what's coming. One of the things you can see is you can see this. You can see an address without any of the other values. But you can also see an address with only a street. You can actually even see an address with only a number and no street. That can happen. Because the CPU can, the core, this core in your CPU can basically say like, oh, like if I look from the viewpoint of this thread, reordering this stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. But if you depend on the fact that you either want to see nothing or everything in another thread, you have a very big problem. So this is, this is a very, this actually like, this is all Ruby code. Um, this happens in C code, of course, but this actually can happen in Ruby code, too. So if you write stuff in Rubinius, but also in JRuby, uh, this stuff is actually something that can actually be problematic. So there's some people working on, like, uh, Rails 4, like, wants to remove, uh, wants to switch to default thread save mode, but they use some, some hashing structures for caching. So it basically means you have to be very careful about, okay, how can we make that, that thread save? So, yeah. We can just move this stuff around. And, well, it's perfectly valid. So how do we fix that? So actually, this is something, actually, this is something you can do in Ruby and Rubinius. We have this method that says implement a memory barrier. And a memory barrier actually means that you tell the CPU, like, no, 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 you cannot reorder this. Like, you have to do everything here before you do it here. So that's how you kind of like enforce that. And the, the thing is that you think like, okay, we do this, and then the other side doesn't have a problem. The thing is that, the problem is that on certain architectures, it isn't a problem. Like if you're on x86, x this works, this is fine. But if you're on, I think, PowerPC or Itanium, you still have a problem because the memory barrier inserts ordering for this current core that it's running on but it doesn't guarantee that the other thread, like the caches, like the cache routing cores, are flushed in the exact same way, so the other threads also see it. So it might be that due to differences in timing or whatever there, the other thread sees uh, 
C is still a half initialized value. So the other, the other core actually has to do a memory rarer too, in that case, on those architectures. At this point, nobody uses Rubinis on that. We don't support it yet, so we don't do that. But uh, it is a certain an issue that, that is valid. So what I would like to ask from you people is please, please try your code. Like, we, sh we, we like, it may sound that we're complaining, but I kind of like have this perverted thing that I kind of like seeing these weird things and, and um, work with them and try to see if I can fix it. So this is like the best contribution that you can do at Rubini is like run your stuff. Like we want to be able to run like almost all the Ruby code out there and, and be, really be a platform for you guys to, to use in the future. So that is it and uh, thank you for your attention. So questions? Questions? There's somebody. Oh. oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, well, no, there was somebody there, but also there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. For garbage collection, uh, uh, is a space uh, reused? Uh, I mean, how is it reused for um, when uh, it's garbage out? How's, you mean how's, how is space reused for garbage collection? Yeah. After after being garbage collected, is the um, space directly basically, available? Basically, yeah. So basically, what happens if that our objects are cleaned up? Uh, we do uh, also for the old generation compacting. So basically, we squeeze them together. So like uh, move objects into new spaces, uh, so that we have large blocks of memory that then can be released again. So we like defragment uh, the memory to do that. So so what's the best use case? Uh, I mean, small allocation, lots of small allocation is better than one big. If you do a lot of small allocations in Rubinius and they live very shortly, that's very cheap. So uh, those garbage collection cycles really take like very, very little time. Um, we want to work on optimizing them in the future because we want to parallelize them or uh, look at what can we make concurrent with the VM running and the garbage collection in a separate thread. So we want to work on that in the future. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I have a couple of questions actually. So the first one is about, um, I remember reading about Rubinius years ago, so I've not followed it uh, lately. Uh, but uh, I remember reading about an, you were implementing an actor API. Uh, yeah. What happened with that? Is that um, still something you're? Uh, that's actually an issue open because it's still in there. It hasn't been updated in a while. But we, I really recommend if you want to do actor style programming to use uh, Celluloid. Because Celluloid actually, um, works really well in Rubinius, and I think Tony Arshiera said that like, Rubinius is currently the fastest platform to run uh, actors on because uh, on JRuby, uh, the, uh, the fiber implementation uh, isn't as fast as it is on MRI and Rubinius, and it uses fibers uh, under the hood very heavily. So I would rec recommend going with Celluloid. Okay, and the other question I have is, how far is this from being production ready? Um, I think if you're doing like, still have like legacy 1.8 stuff, you can run it in production. Uh, we're working on finishing up uh, encoding stuff mainly for 1.9 mode. There's a few other things. Uh, Brian has been working, I don't know if Brian's here somewhere, but he's been working very hard on, on encodings. Uh, encodings are really, really hard and have a lot of tricky edge cases and it's like, sometimes makes you pull your hair out, but um, that's like the biggest thing. So we, we wanna, that's like the biggest thing we wanna do before releasing a 2.0. So that's basically the answer. Okay, thanks. More questions? Yes. I wanted to, wanted to ask you, I, I know there's a project called RubySpec yeah. uh, that you guys uh, do, and I wanted to ask you if it helps uh, with those behaviors from MRI. Um, RubySpec, uh, RubySpec is a project that actually like, specifies the, the behavior of how Ruby should behave, yeah. um, for the people who don't know it. Um, the biggest thing is that um, MRI does not contribute as much to it. So a lot of new stuff they implement, they usually end up writing a very few tests for the behavior, only like 
things they think of as bugs. And so you end up with a lot of behavior that they feel is undefined. But what happens in reality is that they implement a certain feature, and people go depend on how that feature behaves in MRI. Yeah. Even though the people in MRI sometimes themselves say, like, oh, that's undefined behavior. So one of, one of the examples there is, um, like, uh, hashes in 1.9, they became ordered, like insertion ordered. And uh, they committed that to MRI, and basically they said, uh, this is an implementation detail for 1.9, so it's unspecified behavior whether it's true. But it means that because M MRI 1.9 was doing that, everybody got to depend on it. So there's, for us, as alternative implementations like Rubinius and JRuby, there's no other way than to treat it as specified because that's what people depend on. That's what they use. So. Okay. Oh, another question? I don't know how much time for questions we have. But. So we can do like one question or two more. Oh, OK. Tail call optimization. Do you have it? What? Tail, oh, tail, tail call, call. Tail call optimization. No, we don't have it at the moment. At the moment. Oh, but I don't know if everybody knows what tail call optimization is. MRI has it, but it doesn't work. <laughs> Why did they disable it? Yeah, that's, that's the tricky part, the edge cases. <laughs> Then write in Lisp if you want tail call optimizations. <laughs> yeah, why doesn't everybody use Lisp? All right, so uh, thank you, Dikian. A big applause for him. Okay.